Trusting God When You're Struggling, Overcoming Obstacles to Faith by C.E. White, read by Annie Din. Chapter 7 Abandonment Wherever the providence of God may dump us down, in a slum, in a shop, in the desert, we have to labor along the line of His direction. Never allow this thought, I am of no use where I am, because you certainly can be of no use where you are not. Oswald Chambers, so send I you. Alone, unsheltered, betrayed. That's what I think of when I say the word abandoned. It's a personal, painful place to live. I would have said it's not something I struggle with. I wasn't abandoned, after all. But when I started writing this chapter, I was in a room full of other authors during a writing blitz at a retreat, and God began a work of healing I didn't know I needed. Among the clitter-clatter of keys and the scratch of pens, my silent tears began to fall. I felt like God took me into his arms and spoke the words, I'm with you. I'll fight for you. I'll protect you. I'll take care of you. I grew up in a Christian home where I always knew I was loved, but every family has its issues. Our lives were never quite stable or normal, and I felt a lot of uncertainty. Between financial troubles and a parent with mental health issues, it never felt like I had anything to depend on. I know many people had more difficult childhoods, and trust me, I'm grateful for the love, the faith, and the work ethic we were trained up into. I'm also very thankful there was no physical abuse, but my upbringing still fueled me with the determination to never be at anyone else's mercy. I wasn't inclined to trust others with any amount of control over my life. That distrust extended even to God and kept me entrenched in fighting my own battles, making my own path, and never quite believing that God would come through. There are so many Bible stories that encourage me to trust even when I feel God isn't near, but foremost is the story of Joseph. Talk about being alone, abandoned, and betrayed by those who should have protected him. Joseph was only 17 when he was sold into slavery by his older brothers. Can you imagine the trauma? His siblings were so jealous they sold him. The Bible doesn't delve into Joseph's emotions in this story, but how would you have felt? I can answer for myself. Angry, confused, hopeless, despairing, destitute, worthless, unwanted, lost, and everything I said above, alone, unsheltered, and betrayed. This came on the heels of Joseph's dreams of greatness. I doubt he followed his captors into the dusty horizon with the song of thankfulness in his heart. I bet he wrestled with God, and not just a little. But sometime along the way, Joseph decided to be the person God wanted him to be despite his circumstances. He decided to live a life of integrity, prayer, and trust. So he worked his way up to become the manager of a notable household. His master trusted him with everything. God was blessing his diligence. And then came the crash. Another betrayal, just as things seemed to be coming together. Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him, and upon failing, accused him of rape. This was a woman he'd never wronged. When his brother sold him, maybe Joseph even held himself somewhat accountable for their anger, though the punishment certainly didn't fit the crime. He had been talking about that dream, after all. Maybe he'd been a little full of himself. But this? He was doing the right thing the right way. He was above reproach. But the downfall came anyway. I love Joseph's words when he refused Potiphar's wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? We would say the sin would be against Potiphar, but Joseph understood what was really at stake. This would not only be shameful to his earthly position, but to his heavenly one. It's easy for me to forget the eternal consequences of sin rather than just consider the earthly ones. But Joseph went straight to it, and because he wanted to be right before God's eyes instead of just man's, 
he was disgraced and betrayed. Again. It would have been so easy for Joseph to become bitter, to be mad at God. Maybe he was. But if so, we know it didn't last because the cycle repeated. Joseph was honorable and reliable. He worked his way up in the prison. He was trusted by the guards. He interpreted the dreams of a fellow prisoner who should have remembered to mention him to Pharaoh, but didn't. Where would you be in your faith journey at this point? Maybe, once again, angry, confused, and hopeless. I shudder to think. I find it difficult to let go and trust God when someone insults me unfairly or accuses me of something I didn't do even when it has no consequences whatsoever. If my family sold me into slavery, someone unfairly imprisoned me for a crime I didn't commit, then a person I helped left me to rot in prison for years, I can't imagine how shattered I'd be. I would bet money Joseph struggled through these feelings, yet somehow, he remained faithful. I wonder how often he pondered that first dream, the one where his family bowed to him, and wondered what God was doing. He was still interpreting the dreams of others, so he hadn't lost the belief that God spoke in that way. Thirteen years of slavery and prison and abandonment. Did God give you a dream? Maybe years have passed, and you wonder if you imagined it, got confused and misunderstood. The years have been full of pain and betrayal, and no matter what you do, you hit setback after setback. You've been battered by the world, by the enemy. But maybe God's not done, just like he wasn't done with Joseph. When Pharaoh needed a dream interpreter, the cupbearer suddenly remembered, Hey, there was this guy in prison. Joseph's time had come, and because he'd been listening to God, following in the desert all along, he was prepared. This was his Goliath. What if he hadn't been ready? What if he'd been mad at God and languishing in captivity instead of working as for the Lord? Would he still have been able to interpret Pharaoh's dream? Maybe. I know God's success is not dependent on our faithfulness or even our obedience. Perhaps, like Jonah who ran from God, the Lord would have brought him into obedience. Perhaps, like Abraham and Sarah, Joseph would have come back around to his faith after a time of doubt and still been counted as righteous. We can't know. What I do know is that following that path would have left Joseph floundering along the way. If he'd been angry at God and trying to shut him out because of his suffering, he would have missed the joy of the Lord's guidance. I often look back at seasons I didn't like and suddenly see what God was doing. What if I stopped waiting until trials were in my hindsight to trust him? What if I trusted him now and counted it all joy when I met trials of all kinds, knowing that the testing of my faith produces perseverance, and at the end of perseverance comes perfection, a lack of nothing. We know this lacking nothing doesn't mean we will be sinless, nor does it mean we will have everything we want or never be in need. I think it goes back to that all we will have when we seek Him first. The all is Him. The intimacy, the rest, the fullness of a relationship with Him gives us the peace that passes all understanding. Joseph sure seemed to have that, though I'm sure he had his moments. But finally, God's plan had come clear. The famine was coming, and Pharaoh put Joseph in charge. I love the restoration in this story. Joseph was given authority and power and, once again, proved himself an invaluable asset to the people he served. He rose to become second in charge of all of Egypt. That's a great restoration, but it's not all I'm talking about. I'm talking about his family, the betrayers, his first heartbreak. It had been 22 years since he'd seen his family. When I put myself in his shoes, I am crushed by the emotions that must have struck him as his brothers appeared. The story of how he contrived to get them to bring the rest of the family back to Egypt is long, but in it, we see his brokenness, his loneliness, his hope, and possibly even a little of his anger. 
The healing of his deepest wound began that day. God had restored his freedom, his integrity, and now his family. The truth is, we don't always get a neatly wrapped, albeit long time coming, restoration like this in our own lives. There is restoration, of that you can be sure, but it may not come so prettily. Sometimes the restoration is internal. Perhaps someone betrayed and abandoned you. They may never apologize or deserve your forgiveness. The forgiveness is part of your restoration, not theirs. You don't need them to be a part of it. Sometimes God will work the miracle the way he did for Joseph, but it's not required for your healing. Letting go of earthly abandonment may be a thing you grapple with all your life. That doesn't mean it has to control you any more than it controlled Joseph. You can start from where you are and move forward. I have a friend who struggled to forgive a past hurt. She prayed and prayed, but found the anger returning time after time. But anger is just a feeling. Having it is not a sin. It's what you do with it. It's a temptation in your mind and your heart, but it doesn't have to entice you to action. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Your desire for justice and revenge tempts you, but it only becomes sin when you allow it to fester, germinate, and grow. The feeling of anger and hurt may come every day, but if you choose to give it to the Lord over and over, you are still forgiving that hurt, and healing from it will come bit by bit. I forgive. I forgive. I forgive. I wonder how often Joseph had to repeat that in his prayers. We can see by how he lived his life that he did not let bitterness or anger take root and be born. He was humble accepted the painful path God placed him on, and came out on the other side the second most powerful man in the world with a more beautiful story than he could ever have imagined. So, if your hurt is looming large and your emptiness and abandonment is filling you with anger and bitterness, turn it over to God. Allow Him to redeem your heart and your soul in the midst of your pain. Don't wait till you are on the other side of it. Take the first step to becoming the person of faith and righteousness and integrity he's called you to be, despite the obstacles in your seeming powerlessness. You can be who God wants you to be, no matter where you are placed. Redeeming your hurts is his specialty. Takeaways Earthly abandonments and betrayals are often the beginning of God's greatest work in your life not his failure to protect you as it might seem. Walking in righteousness may seem to have no payoff at all in the moment. In fact, it may have terrible consequences. But the ultimate reward will always be ahead of us. On earth, an incomparable intimacy with God, and eventually heaven, which will be a gift so glorious, we will wonder why we ever considered anything else worthy to compare. People may forget you, but God never does. He knows where you're going and how to get you there even when you are powerless and without hope. Probably especially then. Your feelings about being abandoned and betrayed do not have to define or control you, no matter how long they persist. Hand them to God every time they arise and allow Him to fill the void. Replace your inner voice with His. God is sovereign, and there is no situation too big for him to transform to good and to his glory. One day, we will all be able to look back and see his purpose and plan. Don't wait for the hindsight. Trust him today, in the midst of the story. You don't know its end, but he does. Trusting God When You're Struggling, Overcoming Obstacles to Faith by C.E. White Read by Annie Din Copyright 2020 held by Connie E. White 
No portion of this recording may be reproduced without prior written consent. This book contains footnotes, including many scripture references, which are not read in this audiobook. You can download a free PDF with the footnotes at www.cewhitebooks.com forward slash trusting God footnotes. All C.S. Lewis and Oswald Chambers extracts were read by permission. Copyright information for those works is included in the footnote guide. Scripture quotations, unless otherwise indicated in the footnotes, are from the ESV Bible, copyright 2001 by Crossway, a publishing ministry of Good News Publishers, used by permission.